Uh, let's get rolling. Good morning, gentlemen. Name is uh, Alex Cumming from uh, KFT uh, Fire Trainers. Uh, we're based in uh, Montvale, New Jersey. And I'm actually a Canadian. We're, I've been working for them for, for about 30 years now, delivering uh, fire trainers around the world. And uh, this week is uh, here in beautiful Everett. Um, I say that uh, over the years have delivered to um, a number of Navy uh, installations, uh, Australian Navy, um, Norwegian Navy, Canadian Navy, U.S. Navy, uh, Saudi Navy, so um, a, lot of, a lot of time on those. It, uh, the intent today is to uh, go through how to set up, operate, and train with uh, your new uh, live, uh, live fire trailer. It, um, small group, so if uh, you have any questions just stop me and ask even if it's just because you don't understand my Canadian accent. So what we're looking at with this one is uh, basically taking a, we took a container um, turned it into a, a fire trainer mobile unit this is uh, right down at uh, Kings Bay. So this is the um, to give you the background on this, I'm sure everybody's aware of what happened with the Miami when it was in dry dock. And then um, after that fire, during that fire, some firefighters got injured. Um, CNIC decided they had to do something about that as far as um, enhancing the training to the firefighters. So in uh, four years ago, they gave us a contract to build um, four fixed site modular sub trainers and two mobile units and last year we got the, the contract for this uh, third mobile. Um, they're configured partially from in, a, in a sub perspective. So um, entry hatches and um, doorways and some pass-throughs that are, are simulating a, a sub work. So tra trailer itself, 53 feet long, eight feet wide, 13 foot three high, um, weighing about 44,000 pounds, and because it's a shipping container, it, it's made out of core 10 steel, which is a, um, basically a, an ablative steel. It uh, re resists rust a lot, a lot better than just a standard steel. Okay, so the mobile fire trainer is a manually operated vapor propane fueled live fire training center system mounted on a trailer that can be towed to a selected site and be quickly set up to provide safe and efficient fire training exercises for the types of fires normally associated with shipboard or submarine firefighting. Um, so when we, we start talking about propane, we'll, we'll differentiate why we're talking about vapor versus liquid. Um, Am I freaking you with that? Uh, yeah. um, training fire, any area of the MOLIF that is used to con conduct live fire training? And it's all being run through a uh, programmable logic controller. Um, basically, it's a, a PLC is a dumb computer. You send a signal in, i.e. turning a switch. The PLC program tells something to turn on or turn off. That's all a PLC is doing. It, um, in the old days, it would have been done with relays. You send a signal into a relay, makes a contact, goes out and tells it to do something. In this case, with the PLC, if you turn on a pilot switch, it's going to open a couple of valves, turn on an ignition transformer, and create a pilot. So that's what the PLC is doing. Um, we're not looking for you to do any programming that if there's ever an issue with the, tr the uh, trainer, we may ask somebody who's um, technically um, adventurous to take a look at some lights for us while we're talking over the phone to do some tr troubleshooting. So, LEL, percentage level which unburned propane can explode in a confined space. We have sensors inside that will detect this level and shut down the mole lift at 25% of the LEL. Yeah. Um, you know, as firefighters, what do we know about propane? It's dangerous. So for us to stay in business, we have to ensure that you're training in a safe environment and there's a number of safety devices in there to ensure that. Okay. 
So three different views of the, of the, uh, the unit itself. Just going to go through this quickly because we'll be looking at it shortly outside. But from the, the top, uh, we do have a marine hatch up top. And on your unit, there's actually a, an extension platform, a fold-out extension platform. It's one of the things that was the feedback from uh, Kings Bay and New London was that they would like to be able to do uh, tripod work and do rescue down through the hatch as well. So yours is the first that has that extension platform um, to play with the, the tripod. So we're going to be looking for feedback on that as well, whether it's a, a, a useful uh, addition to the, the trainer. Um, on the curb side of the trainer, we have a uh, ship's door or a six dog door to make entry through. Uh, and that will go into however you want to set up the maze inside as far as um, can, uh, narrow spaces and uh, items like that. Up at the front area up here, we have a control room. And in that, we, all, we have the major electronic components like the PLC. And this is where you will start the unit up from. You can monitor um, temperatures and gas levels. Um, you do not have to have somebody in there full time. You know, I, I leave the um, staffing of the fire ground and of the trainer to how you're going to be setting up your SOPs. Um, you know, if you have the bodies available, you can have somebody in there and that will be, uh, be able to uh, give feedback once a team egresses from the unit as to what temperatures they were in, um, were they building propane levels, things like that. Um, but to actually operate the unit once it's been um, brought up to speed, you're actually running the fires from the pendants inside the burn area. So a curbside view down at the back, we have a generator that's running off of uh, the uh, propane supply for the unit. Uh, the uh, six dog door going into, leading into the burn room, uh, door into the control room. On the roadside, up on the gooseneck of the trailer, there's a ladder going up to the gooseneck, another one going up to the roof, so you can um, stage your teams up on, on the roof itself. On the uh, front end of this unit, another addition that was added on was a standpipe, so you can hook in um, your uh, attack lines up on, on the roof. Behind that, we have the uh, propane compartment. We have uh, two 420 pound cylinders, so each cylinder will give you a usable of uh, about uh, 80, 85 gallons of fuel. Um, so with a, a, total, a total of about 170 gallons that you will get two, three days of training out of it, depending on how many evolutions you run through. Uh, exhaust fan which is linked in through the PLC as part of the safety system. An emergency uh, exit door down here or it is also set up that you can use it as um, your structural entry so you can do your structural training inside of here as well as doing the, the shipboard. And down at the back another equipment room. Okay. So top view looking into the interior. Uh, down at the back end, generator, equipment room. This has um, two uh, fire areas down at the rear. We have a bilge fireplace. So we have a, basically a four by six pan that is down at floor level that's going to be filled with water. So your flame is going to be uh, generated quite close to the floor. And what this is going to uh, bring to you is that um, you're going to get the radiant heat from the fire soaking into your gear more just because the fire is that much lower or closer to the, to the floor of the unit. Okay? The higher the, the fire is set up, the higher the area of where the radiant heat is going to be. So it's one, another thing to be aware of when you're taking students in and placing students is how much radiant heat soak they're going to be getting through uh, their gear. Okay? Above or built into the build fireplace, you know, we have um, uh, a seven second ramp up on the flame. So as you turn the, the switch on the pendant, you can go from six inches of flame to five feet of flame over the course of the seven seconds. If you stop bringing it up, it'll stay at that level. In addition, in that 
pan, we have a second uh, burner bar, which is a, a flare up or rollover. You hit that switch and it's just going to give you a five second burst of flame, so more heat, uh, bigger flame happening in that bilge area. Mounted up near the ceiling is the flashover. And if you've been in the MAFTs or the other units, so it's shooting uh, a flame across the ceiling um, in that area. Yeah. Any questions so far? It's all clear as mud. That's what we like. So I'll actually, I do have one. Yep. You said that it's controlled. Um, where's the control? Uh, okay. So. In, on this diagram. Oh, it's just so we're going. We'll get into this a little bit, a little bit more depth. But you have. You're going to be operating the fires from inside, either using the wired pendant or the wireless. Mm -hmm. um, the wired gives you a lot more information just because of the, the lights are giving you feedback on what is happening uh, with the pilot and the flame and all of that. Um, the wireless gives you a little bit of extra mobility. You know, what I've found uh, in teaching in these units is that as the instructor, if I'm running the pendant, I'm going to find a location in there where I'm protected from the flame. I'll set the interior barriers up so that I'm hidden behind a barrier so I'm not taking the heat soak. If you're going to be in there time after time after time, you've got to protect yourself. So I will locate myself somewhere in there with the pendant and let the um, second instructor send the, the group in or lead the group in. But if I'm operating the pendant, I'm going to be in place and have a good visual on what the students are doing and what the fire is doing. Um, so you have know, our fire down back, flash over above it. Uh, on this wall, we have one of the gas detectors, which at 15% of the LEL will uh, speed the exhaust fan up to start pulling some of the unburnt gas out. At 25% of the LEL, it's going to shut the fires off and the fan is going to go into full e extract mode. Okay, so we're only 25% of the way to building a, an explosive mix inside the room and we're shut down. As well, on the wall here, uh, we have a temperature sensor set at the five foot level. At 500 degrees, it's going to speed the exhaust fan up. 700 degrees at the five foot level, it's going to shut the fires off. So basically about 100 degrees per foot. So at the ceiling, we're running almost 1,000 degrees. But what I found over time is that because of the radiant heat, that most of the training evolutions are running in the 350, 400 degree area. Um, and that's where you're getting your heat soak. So you're not really getting up to those uh, sh um, trip or the alarm or um, warning or alarm sets. So, you know, it, it's, it's, we're in there to teach a skill not to melt somebody down. So at least that's my personal view on it. Um, an, e an emergency stop located by the uh, exit door. You hit the emergency stop, fire's gone, smoke is shut off, exhaust fan is in full extract. Mm -hmm. You would reset by pulling it out. There's a 30 second um, run on of the, the fan and then we can bring the fires back up. There's a maze system through here which is comprised of movable panels. So you can reconfigure how the maze goes, either from narrow corridors to um, small equipment spaces for people to get lost in. Um, or, you know, you can use part of that maze to protect yourself as the instructor too. Um, not only from the heat, but from the hulking firefighters walking by with equipment banging you. So I like to hide myself and protect myself in, in the maze somehow. On this side, on the curb side, we have the entry compartment. So on the roof we had the marine hatch. There's a ship's ladder going down from that hatch into a, a compartment space which then has a, a six dog door which leads into the fire area. Mm -hmm. so we move forward through the maze, we come up another emergency stop just inside where the six dog door is on the uh, curb side of the unit. We have another gas detector, 
another temperature sensor, and up at the front end we have a switchboard uh, fireplace. So not a huge fire, not a hot fire because it's contained with inside the, the switchboard, but more from a uh, recognition of the fire, um, good for um, doing tick work, um, and you know, okay, so you're taking somebody in, what, are they going to attack it or are they going to look for a way to isolate? And I'm not sure what your procedures are. I know on some of the uh, units they would bring a, a, a shore crew in to isolate power before they did anything. So again, how, how would you handle that and how would you set up your scenario? So you had a, ship, or a switchboard fire on, on board. Yeah. So, you know, if you're if you're running people through what you know, what are you going to be looking? You're going to be looking for them to tell you that power has been secured before they attack the fire. Up in the front area, uh, on the roadside, we have our our propane tanks. On the curb side, we have our control room. In the um, side view of this in the rear we have our bilge fireplace our exhaust fan we've now relocated the smoke generator up to the switchboard to make it a little bit more of a, a realistic uh, scenario and um, the one thing that you're going to see on here is we have what are called agent detection so as part of the the plc program in this um, we have uh, water sensors and we have thermocouples that are going to react to the application of water. So you can set up uh, various parameters for it, so either, either from easy, medium to hard. Um, so at, you know, if you want to have a hard fire, they have to apply water longer for the flame to die out, and then they have to apply even more as a soak. If they don't do the soak, the flame will come back up. And the, the idea behind setting up these parameter programs is you can make up uh, consistent scenarios. So if you're doing um, a, a skills-based training where you want everybody to go through the exact same scenario, we can set up scenarios with parameters so when they go in and they fight the fire, everybody's fighting essentially the same fire and the fire is going to decay and go out the same way for everybody that goes through. So from a documentation of training, uh, you can, you know, scenario nine and you have it in your list and here's what it is, here's what's going to happen. Yes, firefighter Jones went through and he did this scenario with these parameters, tick the box. Yeah. So there's uh, two agent uh, or water detectors down on the bilge and one up on, on the switchboard. And we'll take a look at those when we're, we're out there. Yeah. So the uh, training fires on the interior, we have the uh, electrical panel up at the, the, the front end of the uh, burn area, we have the bilge fire, we have the rollover fire that's part of that bilge fire, and we have the flashover. Non-fire training, um, we have a smoke machine, so you can just set this up and either do um, rescue training inside of it, um, now that we have the uh, fold-out platform and you can do tripod, so now you can do, you know, uh, victim packaging and recovery inside um, through the, the roof hatch and we have the dog doors and, and the maze panel. So you don't even have to, to be lighting fires to have, to set up some uh, good training scenarios in, inside of this. Okay. Propane system. Say that up at the front we have two 420-pound cylinders. They feed into a uh, main gas manifold. Anytime you're doing training, both tanks are going to be fully open. We want to be drawing the maximum amount of vapor off of the two tanks at once. Mm -hmm. So we come off the tanks, we go up into our main header. Uh, the, you know, there's obviously there's a uh, tank valve, um, uh, some other things that we'll take a look at when we're out there on top of the tanks. There's an isolation valve up here, which is primarily um, a service valve. You know, if we had to do some work or we wanted to isolate, we can shut that valve. Um, from there, it goes through a, a strainer, which just takes out any um, particulates that might be in the, in the, the gas. Um, very rare uh, for that to happen with new tanks. And then into a first stage regulator. As you'll see that on the, the manu uh, manifold, we have a 
gauge up at this end, which is going to be giving us the pressure that's coming directly off the tank. We have a regulator, and then we'll have a gauge after that regulator. Because you're up here in the beautiful northwest where some days are cool and some days are warmer. So what's, what's going on, you know, what are, what's our pressure going to be in those tanks? Right? So we want to ensure a, a constant flame height. So we're going to be dialing in through the first stage regulator. And then when we look into the equipment rooms, we have a second stage regulator. And by NFPA, uh, we're bringing um, our gas into the uh, actual fires at around seven pounds pressure. So in the tank on a day like today, we're probably maybe 55 or 60 pounds. The first stage regulator is going to drop it down to 30. And then we're going to drop it again in the equipment rooms before it goes in uh, to the fires. Hey, Alex. Yep. Quick question for you, Mr. Chief. <clears throat> I was trying to get a large, uh, maybe 5,000 gallon propane tank at each location. Yep. Mm -hmm. Can you bypass this and go directly from, say, a 5,000 gallon tank? You certainly can. Right down here, we have a one inch plug. Take that plug out hook in with a hose to there, leave the tank shut, and you can run. You know, is, you know and that, that's partially because like when uh, Chief White from CNIC was at um, our facility a couple of weeks ago, we always ship these, thing, these tanks empty. So we have a service tank on the ground and we pipe in to that location and we run it from there for testing purposes. So just depiction of what I just walked through in there. So propane, under pressure in the tank. This is hazmat 101, right? It's, um, under, it's liquid in the tank. When it gets out to atmosphere, it goes from the liquid to the vapor, it expands 270 times. That's why propane is a, a, an efficient fuel for us to use for these mobile units as we can carry a fair bit of fuel in a, a relatively small tank. Um, it's heavier than air, so why is that important? It settles, right? If we do have a leak, it is looking for low points. It's looking for drains, it's looking for ditches, and so when we look at site considerations and where we're going to park this thing, we're not going to park it ab above a drain. Because if there is a leak, it gets down into the drain. Next thing you know, somewhere, somebody flushes the toilet and it goes bang. Um, it's explosive diarrhea. Yeah. Um, so uh, boiling point of minus 44 degrees and a flammable range, quite narrow flammable range, 2.5 to 9.7. Yeah. Um, so just out of that, you know, if we get into a little bit of math just for a second, if, I, if we lost a cubic foot of liquid out of one of the tanks, okay, first thing it's going to do is going to expand, right, 270 times. So now we have 270 cubic feet of vapor propane. Dangerous? Yes and no, because it's 270 cubic feet of 100% propane. So you could put a match into it, into that 100%. Right? It's like, you ever do the thing with your brother in the match in the can of gas? You know, you can put a match out in a can of gas. It's the vapors that are the dangerous part. Same thing here. So we have 270 cubic feet of 100% propane. We now have to get it out into its flammable range. So we could go all the way down to the 2.5 or just above the 2.5. So we've now multiplied it another 40 times. So now we're 10,280 cubic feet of explosive area. So out of that one cubic feet. Yeah. So how would we know if there was a leak? Smell it? Right, because it's, it's got an additive in it called ethyl mercaptan, which makes it very noticeable uh, to breathe. It's under pressure. So we're going to hear it. Uh, it's minus 44. So when it escapes to atmosphere, you'll, it'll create frost at where it's escaping. Okay. 
So you can use your senses to do it, you know, and if you have a gas meter, that, you know, it's a very, you know, uh, new way of going at it, but, you know, use your senses, that's going to be the first thing. You know, normally it's like, I, I usually pick it up by smell first. But um, just to be aware of, if you think there is a leak, get a, a spray bottle with some soap or a gas meter and check around to find the leak and shut the tanks off and clear the area. Yeah. You know, especially with a mobile unit going over the road, things bounce around. So um, you want to always be aware that there may be a leak somewhere. Yeah. So with that in mind, transporting it, do you want to unhook the propane cylinders from the built-ins? No, it, because we've got the um, shutoff valves right on the tank. That's where we're. That's where we're shut off. Right, right, right inside the tank. How much propane is held in the, the uh, system itself after it's shut off? Because we're talking about we mm -hmm. leave that on. We, yeah, that at the end of a training day, right. we're going to shut the tanks mm -hmm. and leave the generator running, and that's going to burn any gas out of the lines. And so when the, gener when the generator shuts off, your lines have, are clear of propane. So there's nothing after the tank valves. Oh, no, I understand. I was just wondering how much it held, like, throughout that whole system. If it's like, yeah. Minimal? Minimal. Minimal. You know, it's, it's 50, feet of one in 50 feet of one inch pipe. So yeah. I'm, not, I'm not doing the math on that one. But, um, but very, you know, it, it, the generator takes a couple of minutes to burn the line out. And okay. You're good then. Any questions on that side of it? Okay. Okay. Control system. That um, in the front equipment room where the PLC is located, there's a touch screen uh, which you need the code to um, log in to use the system. And the code is live fire training system, so LFTS. So, uh, five, three, eight, seven. You know, um, depending on how often you use the unit, um, I'm going to give you each a copy of the manual for your own use. You may want to write the password inside the manual so you have it. Um, if you're not using it a lot, it uh, may be something that slips. Okay. And that will get us to um, four different screens, one of which is setting up the parameters, another is um, uh, a daily span check. Because this is a mobile unit that every 24 hour period we have to put calibration gas or the span gas to the two gas detectors in the burn room to verify they're operating correctly. Yeah. It's, um, a span, the span screen will come up you put the gas to the uh, gas head, it'll go up to 45% LEL, that head is good. Put gas on the second head, comes up to 45%, that head is good. Your span check is done for the day. Then from there, you can go to what we call a da daily operational readiness test screen, and you push a start button, and that's just going to start the three, the three pilots, the one for the electrical panel, the one for the bilge, and the one for the flashover, and make sure the pilots are functioning correctly. Once that is cleared, you're into either the fire training screen or the parameters. And with the parameters, as I talked a little bit before, we have extinguish time, soak time. Um, so with the extinguish time, we can set it up as short, medium, or long. I think that's 10, 20, or 30 seconds of, of water passing by the um, uh, agent sensor. And all the agent sensor is, is a, and we'll take a look at one when we're out there, it's just a, a little light that picks up the water flowing by it. Um, and we, depending on how tough an instructor you want to be, if the light is at the bottom, then it picks up the water as soon as it flows. If the light is at the top, then they have to fill the pipe with water to get it to pick up. So it makes it even harder for them to put the fire out. So depends how tough you want to be on the, the students. Yep. So we can choose our short, medium, and, or long for the bilge. Our soak time is how long 
the light has to pick up water for. So it'll see extinguish time for 30 seconds on long. And after the 30 seconds, then it's still looking for, you know, the flame will die out, but it's looking for soaking after that. So it may be looking for another 30 seconds of water flowing by it. So if somebody, uh, great, I put the fire out and they shut their nozzle down, the fire is going to start to build. They have to continue to apply water to soak it. If they don't soak it, it'll come back up. If they do their 10, 20, or 30, depending on what you've chosen for, um, or well, no, no soak time would mean that, okay, that they've extinguished it, good, the flame's gone. Short at um, 20 seconds, they have to keep applying water for 20 seconds to uh, keep the flame from rekindling and 30 seconds at long to keep it from rekindling. So you would choose your fireplace, set up your parameters, choose the second fireplace, choose your parameters, and then you can save that beside a, um, a number. So if scenario one is short, short, okay, that's saved. If scenario two is medium, and short, you can save that. And you can dial up your parameters. So it may be something that wants to be worked at from uh, Chief Snyder's or Chief White's thing to set up some um, scenarios or some parameters and have them on a, a cheat sheet in there saying, okay, we're choosing number one, because you can come back and choose that number one at, at some other time. Okay, so you, once you've set up the scenarios, they're, they're reusable. Are those built-in times, or can you control the time on the short, medium, and long? They are built-in times. If we, if you wanted them to be adjusted, we would have to come back and play on the computer. But what again, are, what are those? 20 and 30 seconds. ten. Well, for extinguish time, ten, twenty, and thirty. Uh, soak time, twenty and thirty. So, but yeah, it, you know, if we were out here doing a visit, it's nothing for one of our technicians to plug in and, and change some times if you find that they're not working for what you're trying to teach. Okay. As well on here, um, you're going to have two more things, one for the torch and one for the flashover. You uh, can either disable or enable them so that they can be run from the pendants. If you disable them, you can't run them from the pendants. If you enable them, they can be run from the pendants. Okay. Any questions on that side of it? Um, it's all detailed in your manuals. Um, I'm an old school kind of guy. I just want to see the guys put the fire out. So I usually set stuff for really long. And then when I think they've done a good job, I shut the fire off. Like leave it in my, my eyes rather than the sensor. But yep. There's your extinguish time, short, medium, or long. Soap time, none short or long. Torch effect is just, um, we're throwing more gas into the bilge area and creating a bigger flame. And that's how you gain your rollover effect? Yeah, that's for the rollover. So the rollover starting from the, the base of the bilge fire and going up. The flashover is coming across the ceiling. And in order for that effect to happen, it has to be held like a dead man. Or yeah. yeah there, well, just press the button and it does it. that on the pendant, when we get into that, is that you know we have a what's called a pause or a dead man button on here. For so for them for there to be fire, that has to be held. Okay. So then we would bring the fire up. That's our main fire. And so if it's the bilge, we're going to be pushing and holding that for seven seconds to get the main. Then we can release it. It's up at the highest it is. We still have to keep holding on the dead man. And then if we want to go for uh, rollover, we have to twist it over and hold it for the maximum of, I think it's five seconds. Flash over the other way for maximum of five seconds. And if you held it for longer, it would just... Shut the button off. Yeah, the, the flame the flame will stop. 
Okay. If you release the dead man, you go back on the dead man, you can do another, the, the main flame will come back up to where you had it, and then you can do another rollover, you can do another flash over. So it's either disabled or enabled. So save and restore. So once we've set up a set of parameters, we can save it. Yeah, then you, if you hit the restore, you can pull back that number that that was associated with, and then bring those parameters back into the into the game. So in the manual, when you're reading through it, so basically when we look at the manuals, there's the official hardbound. This will give you many nights of good bedtime reading. And then there's your personal copy, so you can make make notes in in these, and be it'll be your reference uh, for when you go to to use this. Okay. Um, I don't know how often you're going to be teaching with it. You know, are you going to be using it once a week, once a month, once a quarter? Um, so my suggestion on this is always that. Um, because you got a lot going on in your mind with all the rest of your job is anytime you're going out to set this thing up and operate it, there be at least two instructors. So if somebody forgets something, the other guy can pick up on it, but also be using the, the manual as your, your backup for that. You know, you ever know why there's four firefighters on an engine? <laughs> there's four seats. But also, every firefighter knows 25% of his job. So you put four of them together, and you've got the job. Well, that doesn't include captains, because they know everything. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. so in the manual, we have uh, safety sim symbols, uh, personnel safety uh, responsibilities, uh, student safety guidelines, system safety warnings, cold weather operating guidelines, this is about the first time I've actually had to mention that one recently. Uh, you know, when we were in Guam in July, it wasn't that much of an issue. But, um, and it talks about uh, the propane and the propane properties as well. Um, so good to review all of that when you have the opportunity. Too bad you had to go to Guam in July, huh? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, it was a little warm. Um, safety systems. We have the manual emergency stops. So there's one at uh, each of the entry doors into the uh, burn area. There's one in the front control room on the panel. There's one on the instructor pendant. You push that, fires are gone. There's one on the wireless dead man as well. Okay. So you as the instructor have control of these ones, but um, part of your student briefing, your student walkthrough, should be identifying where the e-stops are for them as well. So that if they get in trouble and you don't see it, they can shut the fire down, or it may be you that is in trouble and you want the fire shut down. So you want them to be very aware of where those e-stops are. And you know, it may be something minor. You know, somebody didn't gear themselves up as well as they should have and they've got a little bit of an opening and they're getting taking some heat from around their mask and you're not seeing it, they can shut it down. Better for them to shut it down, you back out, you sort out what the issue is and then bring the fire up and bring them back in than have somebody injured. Yep. We have the gas detectors, uh, two in the, the burn area and one in the front equipment room at 15% of the LEL. They're going to speed up the exhaust fan, take some of that LEL out of the room at 25% of the LEL, it's going to shut the fires off, shut the smoke off, and fan is at full extract. We have the um, general area temperature or the thermocouples, uh, one near the uh, electrical panel, one near the bilge, 500 degrees, exhaust fan picks up to pull some of the heat out, 700 degrees, shuts the fire off, shut the smoke off, exhaust fan is at full extract. And the safety officer pendants, you know, they both, this. The wireless has a dead man on it. They release that. Fires are off. Pilots are still running, but the fires are off. And same here with your pause or dead man. 
you release that and the fire is going off. Okay. Any questions? Uh, you guys really do want to be done by two o'clock. Okay. So the e-stop locations, one by the uh, rear emergency door, one by the six dog door up at the uh, curbside and one in the control room as well as the one on the, the pendant. Okay. And they are just inside the burn room. You hit that, push it in. That's what breaks the e-stop chain and shuts things down. To reset it, you have to pull it out straight. There will be a 30 second run on of the exhaust fan and then you have to go back into the control room and go back into the fire training screen on the um, touch screen. Okay. The gas de detectors. Two located, one down by the bilge fire, one up by the uh, switchboard, and one in the control room. So on the touch screen, green is normal, less than 15%. Amber is a warning, 15 to 25, and red is a shutdown at 25 or above. Thermocouples, one near the, the bilge, one near the electrical panel, 500 degrees, speeds it up, 700 degrees, goes to full, extract and shuts the fires off. So the actual operation, once we're, we've gone through our screens and we've set up our parameters, from there, we're going to be running off of either the wired or the wireless pendant. That in the control room, control room when we get there, um, there's a uh, transmitter box on the wall that has a plug-in. There's only one place to plug in. So we can either have the wired plugged in or we can have the transmitter for the wireless plugged in. Okay. And, um, I was saying before that you get a lot more feedback using the wired uh, just because of the lights on the wireless there is a you get some feedback through the screen to tell you what's happening but it's you're in a dark environment and it's you know you find it easier to use the wired yeah. you're not um, the wireless worked well on the the modular because it was a three level um, situation three three deck ladder a lot of move a lot more moving around than you will be doing inside of this unit so set find yourself a good comfortable safe location to, to run from and get your your pendant put in place into that location and you'll be good to go so on the wired pendant starting from the top Okay, so we have the um, pilot switch. If we turn that and release it, it will slow flash as the pilot is trying to ignite. Once the pilot ignites, it'll go to a solid blue. If the pilot fails, you'll get a quick flashing. If it fails, then you turn it counterclockwise. That will reset it, go clockwise again and it will attempt again to relight. Below that, you have the flame switch. So for, to make flame, we've got to push in our pause and push in our flame. And on the um, electrical fire at the front, it's on or off. So once I push the um, flame button, the flame comes on, I can take my hand off the flame button, just hold on the pause. I release it, the flame will go out put my uh, finger back on it, the flame's gonna come back up. For the rear, or the bilge fire, I'm on the dead man, I go on to the flame button and I have to hold it for the seven seconds 
for the motor valve to open all the way. If you go four seconds, you're going to get half the flame. Seven seconds, you're going to get the complete flame. Mm -hmm. A release, the motor valve will wind itself down. And push on again, the motor valve will bring itself open again. Mm -hmm. Below that, we have our um, rollover flashover. And skipped one up top here, which is the agent button. If we set up our parameters at long and long, and we've got 30 seconds and 30 seconds, you're getting bored of this kid spraying everywhere but on the fire, you can mimic the agent detection by pushing on the green button. And that will tell the agent sensors, yes, he's actually applying water in the right place. I would rather this was just like the side of a hand and you hit him somewhere, and, you know, went that way, not that way. Um, so, um, below that we have our smoke. The uh, smoke machine we're using is um, uses a, a vegetable oil based product. It's superheated up to 750 degrees, goes through a, 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 that heater and that um, basically burns the vegetable oil, produces a white non-toxic smoke into the environment. Okay. It's being pushed by the nitrogen, whoever brought the nitrogen over, thank you. Um, so you push it once, smoke is on. Push it a second time, smoke is off. Okay. Below that is a vent button. Um, you know, the saying the exhaust fan will ramp up at 15% of LEL or 500 degrees. Well, if you're in there and you want to pull some of the smoke out or you want to drop the temperature, you can push the vent button once, it'll go to full extract. Push it a second time, it'll go back down to normal operation. The bottom button or switch on here is for the fireplace. Fireplace one being the switchboard, fireplace two being the bilge. So if I want to light the pilot on fireplace one or the switchboard, I have to put this into one, do my pilot. If my scenario was also going to involve the bilge, I would then choose two, turn the pilot on for the back, and that way I'll get both pilots running. And then, okay, what's my scenario? My scenario is they're going to make entry. First thing they're going to do is go after the electrical panel fire, so I go back to one. Dead man, fire on. Okay. Now, I'm you know, good with that, off. If I go over to two, dead man, fire, bilge fire is going to come up. But I haven't shut off the front fire. So now I'm going to have both of them going. It, if I want to do a progressive attack where they've hit the, they're going to hit the electrical panel and then go do the bilge after the electrical panel is extinguished. So I get uh, fireplace one, which is the electrical panel. Pilot's on, I'm going to prepare my build fire. So I go to two, get my pilot running down there. Now I'm going to go back to one. They come in, dead man, fire on the front. Okay. Once they've done a good job on that, I release, turn my pilot off on the front, go over to two, dead man, fire and bring up just the rear fire. The front fire, because I've turned the pilot off, is out of the, out of the game now. Okay, it's so a lot of jumping around on here. Yep. Do you need to turn off the pilot, or is, is, that, is that a requirement? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because we've already activated the, the flame mm -hmm. on the front, that every time we go back onto the, the pause, it's going to bring it back up. Yep. So with the sensors and everything, mm -hmm. when it's me, when it's met its soak time, then we have to turn off the pilot after that, like after it's all settled down, or will the pilot automatically Autom automatically shuts off? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if it if they fulfilled those parameters, so yeah. You can drop that thing, and it's going to just cycle through, and it's going to turn off both of these scenarios based on the runtime. No. With the dead man switch. You, oh, you, you still have to have the dead man to have fire. 
Okay. Any questions on? It, it's just it's time on. It's just doing it. It's time on the buttons now. So yeah, yeah it's a bad Reebok commercial or something. Nike, do it. Do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we mimic that with. The wireless, this is for people with really bad vision. Um, so we have the e-stop up in the uh, top corner. Push that. In, fires are gone. On the uh, other corner, we have our start for this, which is going to set, set it up to start transmitting back and forth with the base station. So you would flick it once flick it twice and that would bring it up, power it up and get it to start communicating on the, st on the start. And then on below that you have your choice of fireplace. Same thing as we have on the uh, wired pendant fireplace one or fireplace two. Okay. So what we're going to be working off of. On the far side then if we want to bring, so if we're up in fireplace one we want to start the pilot, we toggle the switch on the pilot up that's going to initiate the pilot on fireplace one. We go down to fireplace two, toggle our pilot up. That'll get that running. Okay. So it's basically the same idea, it's just that you're mobile. The back of this has a battery compartment. So there's four AA batteries in it. Good to have some spares kicking around just in case. And I'm not going to tell you this, but the range is about 1,200 feet. So on those really cold days, no, no. It, um, it, uh, it, but it does give you the ability to locate yourself somewhere out of the, um, the danger zone inside. Is, your, is the screen on that backlight? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on the pens? They say, you know, it really comes down to play time. And that's why today or this afternoon, you know, we're going to gear up and go in there because you've got to see what these things feel like when you've got your gloves on and in the dark environment. So. Questions? I don't want. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, on the, the, the start switch over here. Yeah, so you, once twice to get it to, once is to power it, and once is to get it to communicate. Just like it's doing right now. Oh God, the fire's on, oops. Um, so site considerations, um, that what we're looking for is level ground, uh, preferably something that's paved, that been there, done that years and years ago down in San Francisco area. We had a power plant where we pulled one of these things in on a newly graveled parking lot. And we trained for a week. And by the end of the week, the doorway led right out onto the gravel. It just kept sinking further and further down. So a couple of D9 cats and we were all good to go. I thought you just made a permit. No, no, no. <laughs> um, no drains uh, underneath or in close proximity to the unit so that any, uh, even the, the propane in the attack water, we want it to filter off a little bit before it goes uh, down a drain. Um, no overhead obstructions. Uh, wind direction, you know, more just because you're going to be working on, on, the, on the roof with the, the platform and um, and maneuvering room because we're going to be bringing engines in, laying hoses, make sure you have enough room around this to uh, set up and operate. Okay. The setup is detailed in the manual. Um, my preference is if you just follow it step by step rather than trying to, I know there's four of you and you each know 25% and, but, uh, and Chief is putting together cheat sheets as we speak. Yep. Again, maintenance, um, there's daily, weekly, monthly, uh, semi-annual type things to look at uh, as far as maintenance goes. And we'll go over a few of those when we're out there. 
no um, daily span check we'll do that uh, when we get out there um, the gas heads themselves need an annual calibration so it's it's the procedure for that is in the manual rather than teach you through it today is it a year from now um, pull the sheets out and You'd said that there's 24 hours um, of, of burn time before you need to recalibrate your sensors. Respan them, yeah. Um, and is that, you said that's a daily, or so if you don't, you it, don't do the 24 hours, you still have to check it daily. Right? No, no, no. If, if you're training on a Monday and your next training is the following Monday, just before you do the training the following Monday, you have to respan. You don't have to go out every single day. No, no, I, I understand that. I, I thought it was a time based. Um, yeah, 24 hours. It's a 24 hour clock. Oh, okay. I thought it was 24 hours of, of actual burn time, no, not no, clock time. No, okay. yeah. Clock time. And if you burn for 24 hours, well, you know, straight. Said, uh, no, I wasn't going for 24 hours straight. I meant like if you have a, an eight yeah, hours yeah, right, burn yeah. and eight hours, and then, yeah. then you have to. No, because no. it's actually a clock time. Clock time. Yep. So the sen that's basically what the sensors look like. There's um, an indicator light on them, uh, and then you take the little cover off, you put your um, Tigon tubing onto it, open the, the gas bottle, and you'll get your reading on the touchscreen in the control room. So essentially every single time we go to use it. Okay. How long does one of those cylinders last us? Not long enough. <laughs> well, it's, see, I, it depends on how often you, yeah, how often you, how often you train. Um, if you're training every day, you're probably getting six weeks or so out of a bottle. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll give these ones to as well, Chief. Is, um, I'm a big believer in, in some cheat sheets and that... Um, I'm going to be going around and there's, I call, I call these the seven deadly sins. There's basically seven steps to get the unit up and operational and seven steps to shut it down. So I'm going to go put numbers on at the locations of the seven. So when you go out there with the seven deadly sin list, you go, okay, where's number one? Okay, it's the propane tanks. Let's turn the propane tanks. Two, so let's start the generator. Three, in the control room, where's the the disconnect? And so there'll be a number on each of those locations that you have to do to start it up. So it's a, a memory aid in a conjunction with um, whatever SOP sheets are, are put together. So there's the, um, so I've got the, the login uh, to the screen on there as well. And then the reverse for the, the shutdown. Maintenance, uh, look in section four of your ops manual for maintenance procedures. Mm -hmm. Let's go make some fire. <laughs>